You're watching Tag TV. Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a program that talks about breeding of terrorism and its impact on South Asian nations. Let's begin with the headlines first. Deadly bomb blast rocks Lahore's Anarkali market. Afghan identity and culture facing threat under Taliban rule. And Pakistan under terror scanner after Texas synagogue attack. Let's begin with Pakistan, where a powerful bombing struck a crowded bazaar in the country's second largest city, Lahore. The blast was so powerful that it damaged several shops at the famous Anarkali Bazaar. A newly formed separatist group from southwestern Balochistan province claimed responsibility for the attack which killed at least three people. Take a look. At least three people were killed and 22 wounded by a bomb blast in the Pakistani megacity of Lahore. The explosion happened in old Lahore's famous Anarkali market, damaging several motorbikes and upturning market stalls. Initial investigations show that it was a time control device on a motorbike which was the cause of the blast. The injured were shifted to the Mayo Hospital where two succumbed to their injuries. I was from the from the house, but I was so was the the सामने जो पटूरा लगा था उसी टाइम डेथ हो गई उसकी जो रागीर बच्चा था वो उसकी दोनों टांगें खत्म हो गई थी और साइड से सब मैंने उठाया है तो उसका कोई वो उसी वो भी डेथ हो गई थी वो भी एक्सपायर हो गया और बड़ा شدید धमाका था इसका क्या बता सकते हैं आप आवर्स आफ्टर द अटैक द न्यूली फॉर्मड बलूचिस्तान नेशनलिस्ट पार्टी सेड इट वाज बिहाइंड द बॉम्बिंग the group was established earlier this month when two minor separatist groups, the Balochistan Republican Army and the United Baloch Army merged and appointed Murid Baloch as their spokesman. Baloch claimed responsibility for the attack in the posting on Twitter. Baloch separatists have been fighting a low-key insurgency against the Pakistani government to demand a greater share in the local mineral-rich resources. They usually attack government interests or Chinese projects in the province, but an attack in a city like Lahore is rare. Therefore, it is too early to say which group really was behind the blast. Hal hi me, ek baloch militant organization, jo ke azadi ke huriyat pasand hai, baloch national army, ek hal hi me alliance bana hai. उन्होंने ये रिस्पांसिबिलिटी कबूल की है कि लाहौर बम धमाका हमने किया है जिसमें डजनों के हिसाब से लोग जख्मी हुए हैं चार मरने की इतला है पाकिस्तान में हमेशा ये मरने की लिस्ट है ना छोटी रखी जाती है बनोच नेशनल आर्मी के तर्जुमान मुरीद बलोच ने मीडिया को बयान में कहा कि बीएनए लाहौर में रिमोट कंट्रोल बम धमाके की जिम्मेदारी कबूल करती है तर्जुमान ने कहा कि धमाके का असल टारगेट पाकिस्तान बैंक के अहलकार और पुलिस गार्ड थे जो काफी लोग बैंकर और पुलिस वाले मरे हैं और जख्मी हुए हैं उन्होंने कहा कि हम पूरी दुनिया में यह बताना चाह रहे हैं कि हमारे धमाके का मकसद पाकिस्तान फोर्सेस की बलूचिस्तान में औरतों और बच्चों के खिलाफ Worst kind of human rights violation, torture, or murder disappearance ke khilaf ek protest hai ye jo ke humne bam dhamaake ki surat mein aapko bataya hai. Pakistan has recently seen a flurry of attacks including in urban areas and the Pakistani Taliban has claimed multiple attacks. The group Emboldened since the Afghan Taliban seized power, has warned of more such attacks to come. People of Pakistan had elected Imran Khan government with high hopes of seeing peace and tranquility in the nation. But in contrary to their expectations, Imran Khan government failed miserably in securing the interests of his people. 
the law and order situation of the country is at an all-time low. Pakistan's influence of the extremist ideology has increased with radical elements dominating the violence in the society. It appears that religious radicalism is moving from Pakistan to Western countries. The recent Texas synagogue attack has brought the notorious South Asian country back under terror scanner in the United States. A report. But why are you doing that, man? Just for, why are you doing that for? Yeah, what's wrong with you? D don't worry about it. Yeah, just, just you don't worry about what I'm doing. You just do what you got to do. Yeah, I just I've come to die. Why but, you come to but die? But I for? need to do that. Why? I've come to die. I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. You just heard the last phone call made by a Pakistani origin UK national Malik Faisal Akram during his siege of a Texas synagogue in America. 44 year old Faisal took four people hostage at a synagogue for 10 hours before an FBI SWAT team stormed the building and ended a tense standoff. The service was live streamed and captured the audio of Faisal demanding the release of Afia Siddiqui, a Pakistani neuroscientist who is currently serving an 86 year prison term in the US. The situation was resolved with the release of hostages and the death of the hostage taker, but the demand of the suspect has brought back global jihad on the agenda. The incident was latest in long line of jihadi attempts to free Al-Qaeda linked neuroscientist who has doctorate from Brandeis University. Also known as Lady Al-Qaeda, Siddiqui was married to the nephew of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, Pakistani national and the prime accused in the 9-11 attack. The involvement of a Pakistani origin UK national in the siege shows the deep-seated religious radicalization within Pakistan and UK among Muslim community. Siddiqui's imprisonment in Texas is being used as a rationale for terrorism against Americans, this time in the United States itself. This was an act of terror. This was an act of terror. And it not only was uh, related to someone who had been arrested, I might add, 15 years ago and been in jail for 10 years. The idea is it was something new. Uh, and. Uh, they did just a great job. I also told him that I wanted to make sure we got the word out to synagogues and, and places of worship that we're not going to tolerate this, that we have this capacity to deal with assaults on particularly the anti-Semitism that has grown up. Since 2010, there have been other hostage-taking incidents across the world where hostage-takers insisted Washington release the Pakistani prisoner, Afia. Pakistan Prime Minister Imran Khan, various Islamist political parties and jihadist groups have all competed to spearhead the campaign to free Siddiqui, casting it as a struggle for Islam and the honour of Muslim women against a predatory West. In 2018, the Pakistani Senate unanimously passed a resolution to take up the matter of Siddiqui's release with the US, referring to her as the daughter of the nation. If Pakistani origin UK national Malik Faisal Akram was the spearhead, the Pakistan government has been instrumental in radicalizing Pak origin Muslims globally towards pan Islamic jihadi causes since President Jiaul Haq days. Pakistan origin youths living in the West have embraced violence and the British have traced 70% of such youths to Pakistan. From the Omar Sheikh, the most notorious Britain in 1994, to London Bridge attacker Osman Khan in 2019. The migrants from Pakistan, including those living and educated there and although enjoying freedom, have taken to terrorism. Pakistanis get radicalized after migrating to the Western countries and their children get radicalized growing up in labor class communities where Islam is practiced in more intense forms. From Al Mezaroon's founder Anjum Chaudhry to other hate preachers and their hardline supporters, there is a long list available. Unsurprisingly, Pakistan establishment supports them both ideologically and financially. These radical youths are continuously promoting hostility and discrimination against Jews in Western countries. Jews who simply wanted to go and practice their faith on the Sabbath, on the Shabbat, in a na neighborhood synagogue faced this kind of danger. And it wasn't the first time, nor was it the second or third time. It's becoming an increasing phenomenon in the United States. And for me, it's outrageous that in this country, which I love so much, which I'm sure we all love so much, we are facing this increasing spate 
of anti-Semitic attacks. The FBI says that roughly 60% of all faith-based hate crimes in America in recent years have been targeted at 2% of the population, the Jews. Recent years have seen increasing international interest in the connections between jihadis in the Western countries and their counterparts in Pakistan. Attention has focused on how such groups and individuals could link up and cooperate to carry out attacks in Europe, South Asia or the United States. Countries like Britain and the United States are forced to pay a price for hosting militant youths from Pakistan and failing to curb their radicalization. Terrorism and all its manifestations are unacceptable and never be justified. Today, all states in every region are vulnerable to terrorism and this menace has become a global concern. Recently, India's permanent representative to the UN, T.S. Tirumurthy, strongly condemned the terror attack in Abu Dhabi, where two Indians lost their lives. Have a look. India has been a constant victim of terrorism. It poses a significant threat to the people of India. Compared to other countries, India faces a wide range of terror groups. However, with its revived counter-terrorism strategies, the country has not only managed to defeat this menace at home, but is also leading the collective fight against this global threat. New Delhi is not only concerned about the safety and security of people living in its own territory, but it always reiterates adopting and executing improved strategies to counter terrorism globally. Just a few days back, India at International Counter Terrorism Committee Conference condemned the drone attack by Yemen's Houthi rebels in the United Arab Emirates that killed two Indian nationals. Let me also express my strong condemnation of the recent terror attack in Abu Dhabi, in which two Indians have tragically lost their lives. Such an attack on innocent civilians and civilian infrastructure is completely unacceptable. It is a blatant violation of international law and is also against all civilized norms. India stands in solidarity with UAE and extends its full support for an unequivocal condemnation of this terrorist attack by the Council. It is important that the Council stands united in sending a clear signal against such heinous acts of terror. For several years, India has been battling terrorism with great determination, and it keeps raising its voice against this menace at the international level. Recently, India assumed the chair of the Counter-Terrorism Committee and revealed its commitment towards global terrorism. More importantly, New Delhi will ensure that the global response to the threat of terrorism remains unambiguous, undivided and effective. The South Asian nation has called on member states to remain united against the tendency of labeling acts of terrorism based on its motivation. India has never hesitated in raising its voice against the country which promotes terrorism. Recently, India exposed Pakistan at the International Counterterrorism Conference by referring to the crime syndicates responsible for the 1993 Mumbai bomb blasts who are enjoying five-star hospitality in Pakistan and given state protection. Uh, terrorism is the biggest threat of the century among uh, climate change and others. But at the same time, the problem is that this is a global problem. And the double standards and the global regime uh, has not yielded the results that one would have asked for. And in that case, the countries like Pakistan, uh, which have been uh, very much uh, the haven of terrorists and large number of sanctioned terrorists are uh, moving around freely with their state support and protection and are enjoying their hospitality. So he really called out that in accordance with the 1267 sanctions committee that India currently chairs, uh, they, uh, the 2611 terrorists, he mentioned about them, that they were not only protected from there, and this is all recorded, and they are still moving around scot-free, and uh, uh, the, the Pakistani government has not taken any action against that. So they have been provided the state protection, they have been provided 
uh, all kinds of assistance to not only stay there but also to prosper. Terrorism in all its forms and manifestations is to be condemned and there cannot be any exception or justification for any act of terrorism. The chairing of the Counter-Terrorism Committee has a special resonance for India, which has not only been at the forefront of fighting terrorism, especially cross-border terrorism, but has also been one of its biggest victims. Chairing this committee is a ringing endorsement of the country's leadership in the fight against terrorism. It will help keep the focus on the presence of terrorists and their sponsors threatening the peace in the South Asian region and beyond. Now let's talk about Afghanistan where the Taliban is becoming intolerant of an idea and the culture that does not fit with the orthodox mindset. In the war-torn country, the extremist group is imposing harsh interpretation of Islamic law through its inhuman act on the people of Afghanistan. Every other day, new videos are emerging and exhibit the real face of the Taliban. With the return of the Taliban's rule, people in Afghanistan are scared for their rights and lives. The Islamist group has broken its promises to safeguard women and protect human rights. The news of targeted killings and extrajudicial executions are coming every day from the war-torn country. The de facto rulers of the region are now attacking symbols of Afghan culture that define the Afghan identity. Just a few days back, in a viral video tweeted by a senior journalist of Afghanistan, Abdul Hakomiri, a local musician can be seen crying in front of the Taliban, who burned all his musical instruments publicly, while the others can be seen recording the video of the miserable condition. This video in the public domain is from Afghanistan's Paktia province, where a Taliban militant is seen pointing a gun and laughing at the musician, while another is recording a video of the situation. This act by the militant group garnered a lot of criticism across social media, while there were many who stood in solidarity with the musician. The last time they came to power, they not only banned music, smashed musical instruments, they also smashed the, uh, destroyed the Bamiyan Buddhas. Now, those symbols have already been destroyed. So, in the next time round, they were doing the next thing that is possible, that is, wherever they are looking at people playing uh, musical instruments, they are humiliating them, beating them up, and in front of them, they are destroying all these musical instruments. And those videos where the musicians are crying because they are uh, identity, their instruments through which they earn their living, through which they keep Afghan culture alive, they are being smashed in front of them, in front of, by laughing members of the Taliban who are actually laughing about it. It's heartrending, but then this is, we know Taliban does, does this, they did it last time and they are again doing it. So this is not surprising. It is cruel, it is saddening, but it is not surprising. This viral video is just another addition to the list of inhuman drama by the Islamist group. Earlier, the Taliban had ordered a ban on all musical concerts at weddings and other social events. Even, they instructed the hotels to separate male and female guests in the wedding ceremony. Music in vehicles is already banned. The Taliban passed a series of controversial orders against women after they forcibly assumed power in Kabul. Last year, the Taliban had ordered the removal of all the banners and posters that featured pictures of women. Apart from all this, the Ministry of Virtue and Vice addressed a letter to all the women athletes wherein it directed women not to visit sports and health centres alone. The Ministry recommended women to visit the places along with a male companion. This time it was hoped, I don't know who hoped it, that since they were, had managed to make recruits among uh, the Hazaras, among the Uzbeks, among the Tajiks, it would be an all-inclusive government, at least ethnically. It is now clear that the Taliban government that you see today, if you look at it ethnically, 55% of the population is not represented. And even the ones who are in power are basically members of the Haqqani network. So this is a government that is completely in the hands of the Pakistanis. So... 
all this talk that it would be an inclusive government have proved false because the Taliban will just not share power with anybody. future of Afghanistan looks uncertain. A mist of uncertainty looms over Afghanistan and people in the country are now gradually losing their hope. Taliban have tried to assuage fears that their rule will be marked by the same level of brutality that became a hallmark of their previous stint in power. Common Afghan people are now fearful of what comes next. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on the behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care. You're watching Tag TV.